Hello. Am I audible? Yes. I know Maru Abhyakhyan, Niranjan Bhagat Nishmuruti Neh Samarpit. Thank you, Rajendra. Thank you, Shailesh Bhai. What I have in my hand today, can you put up the lights? <coughs> okay, then, Pankaj. Are actually three paintings or three painters, to be specific, from different periods of time. My own reading or understanding is <clears throat> that the moment we begin to look at a painting, and if we begin to probe the painting, we literally enter the painting and become, in a sense, part of the process of painting. We don't become painters. So, what I have today are three paintings. One is by an artist called Diego Velasquez, who was active in the 17th century in Madrid, Spain. I have another painter called Vishen Das, who was active also in the 17th century, but 50 years before Velasquez a painter called Vishandas at the court of Jahangir. And I have the work of an artist called Vinod Bihari Mukherjee, an artist who was active at the cusp of independence of India. So I am beginning with the first. <clears throat> there are stories and stories about paintings. Ancient Romans used to paint walls of their houses. This one is from Pompeii. This was part of the Roman Empire. Where they used to paint buildings on the walls. Sometimes doors on the walls. Sometimes to dupe gullible outsiders to believe as though there is a real door who would bang their heads trying to get out of it. So Romans also circulated a kind of a story of paintings which became, came to life. So there would be paintings of fruits and edibles where they would claim that bees would come and sit upon them. So painting does all kinds of things. And in that sense, it continued this whole story of getting into the painting right up to, let us say, the 15th century when in, in Europe a new medium of painting was invented which is called oil painting. And it is perhaps this particular painting called Marriage of Arnolfini, who was a merchant, who was getting married. And he employed perhaps an artist called Jan van Eyck, a Flemish painter, to make a portrait of him and his wife. So you see the bride on the left and the bridegroom on the right. But what is interesting is that in the picture there is a, a kind of a mirror. If you can look at it carefully, it is a convex mirror. In the convex mirror you see the reflection of the back of these two, 
as well as the rest of the things which are visible from, from the back. So a painting is only, it's not only representing what is visible in front, painting is also representing what is not visible, what is not in front of the eye. So the device of mirror was used to show that the marriage was taking place and that if you see very carefully, you might also see the painter right there at the end. So in a way the painter declares, I am here. So he is a kind of a witness to this event of marriage that is taking place. But this is happening through painting in the 15th century. There is this painting by Diego Velasquez in his early career around 1618 where he has painted a water cellar of Seville. Seville is a town in Spain. One of our friends, a British artist called Howard Hodgkin once mentioned that looking at this painting, standing in front of it, you literally feel the coolness of the pot. Where does this coolness come from? From the act of painting. And later I saw this painting by Velasquez. A little later, it also in the 17th century, perhaps not in the middle, but earlier, <coughs> an old woman cooking an egg. This is in the Scottish National Gallery, standing in front of me, standing in front of this painting. When I looked at carefully and went close by, I almost felt the smell of the egg being fried. But the painting that I am going to talk to you today in detail is called Las Meninas, which mean, ma means maids of honor. That means the royal ladies. That is royal ladies mean Princess Infanta Margarita, the young lady right in the center at the bottom with her maids who are surrounding her, two of them. And you have two midgets on the right. You have a dog in front. And you have the studio of the artist. So apparently, Princess Infanta Margarita is visiting the studio of the royal artist because Diego Velasquez was in the service of the king. Now it is interesting to see that just behind these three person, three or four personages, there is the painter. If you look at it carefully, you will find him there. And he is standing in front of a large canvas. And when I saw this painting in the museum of Prado in Madrid, some years ago, I found a small spot in front of the painting. So I went to the spot and looked at the painting. When I looked at the painting from the spot, it looked almost apparition, apparitional, as though everything came alive, as though there is, there are all these characters, <coughs> as though there is the artist as though there is this canvas. But most interestingly I found that when I looked at the artist painted in his canvas, his eyes meeting my eyes. And I thought that this is from the point where he has painted this particular picture. Am I clear about this? That this is the spot from where he has painted this picture. But actually he is painting the picture. So you have a painting which he is in the act of painting. But suddenly you discover that 
there is a mirror at the back in the painting. And you see the artist and on the right, right at the end in the big room of our studio, king and queen. So king and queen are in the mirror. In other words, king and queen are standing where I am standing. I as a viewer, I am standing there. And Velasco has this very large painting on which he is making a portrait of king and queen. Strangely enough, I have not found a portrait of the king and queen made by Diego Velasco. But at the same time, there is a sudden realization that as though where you are standing, Velasco is looking at it because he is painting you. In other words, every viewer who comes to see this painting and stands on that spot realizes that Velasco is looking straight into the eye. But actually you realize that is not the truth. Velasco, you don't have any place, you know, because that happened some hundreds of years ago. And you also realize that there are no king and queen. Then who is there? So actually Velasque himself while painting this picture is standing where you are standing now. Am I clear? Which in other words means that Velasque is looking at himself painting this painting called Last Man in Us. I hope I am clear about this. So it is not a simple picture. He is taking the device of mirror to show that king and queen are there, but king and queen are not there because there is no painting of king and queen. You are standing where he was standing and painting that picture, but apparently you are not painting. He is not painting you. He is not painting any viewer that comes and stands there. But who stands there? It was he who was standing there painting this particular picture. In other words, it is an artist looking at himself. So there is an artist within the painting and outside the painting. With that, as you can imagine, everything else becomes part of the prop of the kind of world that he is painting. He is not actually painting Infanta Margarita. He is not painting the midgets, he is not painting the room, he is painting himself. And in a way he is having a dialogue with himself. And if you see his face carefully, you see that there is a kind of an expression of certain kind of a sullenness, a certain kind of a sadness. It is said that Spain was going through great strife in those years. It is quite possible that he is reflecting on it. It's quite possible that he is reflecting upon what is going on. So what does a painter do when he is commissioned to paint a picture? And he, obviously his patrons must have been very happy to see the painting of Infanta Margarita, the princess and the dog and everything. But in actual fact, what he has done is to diffuse them. He has literally erased them from your memory and he is having a dialogue with himself. So this is the kind of a magic that you can play with in a what you call easel painting. Easel painting is a painting in which there is that kind of a what you call naturalism or illusionism that becomes central. Illusionism is sometimes mixed up with realism and that's why people feel as though it is real. What I have here, as you can see the painting again, and you can see the brooding artist, you can see all the dramatist persona, and very interestingly, I won't go into details of all the, you know, formal components of the painting, but if you were to look at it, there are several paintings on the wall. 
So what is in a way saying is that every painting in that sense has a painter looking out at himself. So an act of painting in which the painter looks at himself, the world that he creates is a world of illusion. <clears throat> there are several other factors that one can talk about, but for the sake of time I will proceed further. So I hope I have made myself clear about this particular work. Well, that easel painting was about ten foot high. So that you have a figure of a human figure which is five foot or six foot can be seen as of the same size. In India the painting was made, especially in the 15th and the 16th century, now I'm talking about 17th century in the period of Emperor Jahangir. The artists worked sitting on the floor. They worked on a small piece of paper. Often it is about what may I say about 12 inches by 8 inches, roughly that size. You have the size of what you call A4 now. It's a, almost like page of a book. And they painted smaller or slightly bigger work, but mostly painted on the floor, like you see the two painters working here. So the painter I'm going to talk to you about today is called Bishandas. Bishandas was credited with the ability to draw the likeness of human figure to such an extent that Jahangir in fact sent him abroad to his cousins in Iran. Actually they were his rivals. So in a way it was a kind of a desire on the part of the emperor to take the likenesses of his cousins, his rivals, which the painter would do and perhaps reveal their intentions through the painting that Vishandas would make. So in a way, painter was supposed to have the skill to enter into the character of the person that he is painting. So Vishandas was credited with that kind of a ability to enter the body of a human being. I have a painting here which you may Look at it carefully. It is called House of Sheikh Pool. I made inquiries about the name Sheikh Pool with some scholars of Sufism and they were able to tell me that yes, there was somebody like that, but not much information is available. So what you find here is that there is a character called Sheikh Pool. His name is Pool, flower. And there is a statement which must have been written later after the painting was done by the perhaps librarian of the court of the court of Jahangir. That this mad fakir has now moved to Agra. That's all it says. It doesn't say anything. So if you look at carefully, and perhaps if you look at with me, as you realize that there are a number of characters in the painting, but there is a dark figure right in the middle. This figure is seated, and what do you see? This figure seems to be in the act of doing something we do not know. So I will bring them closer to you. So here is Sheikh Pool, a kind of Sufi saint, about whom we have hardly any information, but he could perhaps be one of those who brought about some kind of a meeting of communities of different beliefs and they worked towards that. But they lived a very simple, ordinary life. Sometimes they lived the life of workmen. In this case, you know, he has no job. What he is doing, he is digging the ground, he is sitting on. He has got some instrument in his hand. 
And if you look at it carefully, you find that there is a boy who is leaning behind him, who is offering him something. <coughs> I'm afraid the slide may not show clearly, but it shows vapor, which means there is a warm drink, some kind of a hot uh, liquid that is cooked for him and that this boy is bringing to him, but he is not looking at it. You can have a look at this too. Look at the way Vishandas has painted the image of Shetkul, dark man, elderly, with disabled hair, with some little piece of, some kind of a cloth lying on the floor. But he is painting something which is the color of earth. If you see the earth on which he is sitting, and if you see his own color, and you find as though he has emerged out of that earth. He is not somebody, you know, who has been brought from somewhere else, but somebody whose color of the body or whose act also by digging it as though he is having some kind of whatever it is, a dialogue with the earth. Whereas the little boy is offering him this warm drink. And behind the boy stands a man in Purnish, or as they say that he bows. He has perhaps come to deliver some message. Perhaps he is an emissary. And he bows down. And as you can see that there is an action which is repeated. While Sheikh Pole is on ground and you can see the boy literally following his movement and you can see the bowed man, so third person. So literally the painter is creating a kind of a movement and you can see one after the other <coughs> and here is this man he bows down in kind of a reverence or respect. Perhaps he wants to deliver a message. But behind him in the little shack, you can see a man seated. Possibly somebody who looks after the saint. Somebody who looks after Sheikh Poli. There is a little shack behind that building. So you have little further. So suddenly then you realize if you go further, would you would you want me to go back and see? See, here it is. Here is the, there are three, and then you go back. You now find that somebody is pouring a drink, which the little boy has carried for shake food. So you have also the source of the drink, somebody who is passing by every day. And here is a wayward looking man, you know, kind of a fakir, a kind of a you know, anyway, uh, we do not know who he is, but they are all in awe, or perhaps they all respect him. So this man is pouring the drink. So you are moving from uh, rightward, from the image of the shake pool. And you come on the side. Shall I go back to show you where it is? Yeah. You see, they are all, all uh, you can see the man who is pouring the drink on the right and you can see all these men at the bottom, on the ground. So here is somebody who looks like a, a courtly figure, perhaps some kind of a minor princeling, I don't know who is pointing at or showing, um, expressing it. Though. Look at the wayward way of this man, you know, look at him. And he is fully dressed as you can see from his turban from his uh, jama, and there is an elderly man who is very closely listening to him. There is a man in dark who is also very curious about it. So they are all looking at him. Well, it is interesting that this man is speaking. How do you know he is speaking? If you look at his face, you find two teeth very clearly seen. So that is a kind of an indication of some kind of a speech that is taking place. So beside the hand, the gesture, the mouth also shows that. 
And then, what you see below are the clothings of these people who have gathered there. The prince, the old man and the other man. What you see here, and if you go, if you look at it carefully, you will see that there are clothings which have been worn perhaps several times. There is the prince who has got absolutely clean, washed garments. Whereas others have kind of as garments, you know, which have been worn over and over and over. But what is interesting is that beside those three, four figures, right at the bottom, you see a man with a pot. Somebody, you know, who goes to his daily routine of morning uh, by selling some, something that he has got in the pot or maybe just water. So you reach from there to the figure which is right at the bottom of the painting. And then you move forward. Can I, shall I show you again? Look at the whole painting and you will see that you have those three men on the, on the right. You have this figure sweeping the floor. Now, man sweeping the floor is exactly opposite the figure of the little boy who is offering the warm drink to the saint. Now, I'm going back. And you have the sweeper. So everybody is watching him. And the sweeper perhaps comes every day to clean the ground around him. So they are showing their respect toward this man who is some, you know, who holds everybody, you know, they, everybody looks at him as though he is a revered figure. And so he, perhaps, his act of paying homage is to clean the floor around the place where he is sitting. And when you go further, you have this, anyway, there are some figures which have not come. Let me see. I can't go back, but let me see if I come. Uh, my slides have been slightly mixed up. How do I go? Anyway, can I go to whole thing? No. Anyway, what I'll do, I'll show you the full painting and talk about that. So you look at those three men on the right. One man, the, a courtier looking man, pointing toward Sheikh Pool. And then there is the figure on the right which is not visible here. But you have a soldier, perhaps a Turkish soldier, with, with his hat, you know, with his headdress, who is sort of saluting the man. You know, he raises his hand over his head. There is a man right at the bottom, if you see. And if you see carefully, I don't know whether it, it doesn't show it very clearly, but he is a bishti, that means water carrier, somebody who sells water. Then there is the man who is sweeping the floor. Then there is a soldier, a Hindu soldier. And if you see, I do not know whether I have the slide fully, but I will, unfortunately that slide is missing. So I will show you, I'll go back to the whole thing. So you have, there is a telak part on the forehead of this particular soldier who is also passing. And then there is a woman right at the, on the left who is looking back. And if you go further from there, there is a man who is also saluting, a dark man with a turban. And then on top, you see, These three women, and there is a boy, they are all looking at it rather in kind of a bemused manner as to what is this man, who is this man, and why is he sitting there doing what? So we go back to the whole painting and then we return. So you have the whole street literally focusing upon this man. But the man doesn't reciprocate, he is not looking at them. They are all, it looks as though they are looking at him. And then if you were to think about the figure of Sheikh Pool, little boy, the emissary, the man pouring drink, or the 
three persons and then man with the water pot, and the Turkish soldier, the man uh, sweeping the floor, a, a, a local soldier, a woman, then another man on the left. You literally have gone round him. You have made a circle, almost like Pradakshina, almost like circumambulation, that here is this man. All these figures are literally going around. And then you go further about the figures of these women in the street, and you find two crows, the ubiquitous birds in our landscape. And then there is a big neem tree, actually there are two trees which are crowning this kind of a building that he lives in, a small kind of a, what you call, I don't know whether it is a real shrine or something, but he lives there, as you can see that there is some way to go inside. And there, as you have already seen, the man seated in the shack. So, what Bishandas does, this painter, whom Jahangir even trusted by sending him abroad to take the likenesses of his cousin, is actually now painting something which is an antithesis of imperial image. There is nothing royal about it. There is nothing grand about it. It is something very simple. It is a street scene. And in the street you have a man. He is like one of those, you know, who, those unnamed poets, writers, perhaps, you know, singers. But those who actually lived with people and perhaps entered into the lives of people and made their life perhaps a little better. So here is, I have an image. You have begun with the royal portraiture of Velasquez to you have as literally to a common street in India and it would not be surprising to find that you have this crowning tree above it that also literally surrounds and if you were to draw a bigger circle you could even bring the tree and the dome into your circumambulation. Ah, and here is the figure. This arouses that kind of a tremendous empathy with which it is painted. It is not painted with just kind of a looking at somebody and making a portrait, but trying to reveal the inner character of the man. And that is done through the simple act of drawing. And as you can see, as I had tried to point it out, that the artist is painting earth, artist is painting dust, something which nobody ever cares. That he doesn't need anything else, but he uses color which are colors of earth. And the man, it looks as though he is made of those colors. Well, there is a little shrine like this in the city of Baroda. So I am not surprised that such things existed in the 17th century, but they might have also existed in the 19th and the 20th century. I am coming to the story of the eye. Here is a painter called Vinod Bihari Mukherjee, who was born with a slight defect in his vision. And there was some kind of a medical treatment, whether it was because of the treatment or whatever, but he lost an eye. Here is the boy in the middle, is Vinod, little Vinod, with his brother. That he grew up and studied in Shantiniketan. His family brought him there. There is a long story about his coming to Shantiniketan and getting admitted, etc. I will not go into details of that. But he actually became part of a kind of a trinity. And if you were to think of three great artists of Shantiniketan of the period, the main figure, the principal figure, the, the teacher called Nandalal Bose, had these two amazing artists, 
One is called Ram Kinkar. Ram Kinkar Bhaj. Ram Kinkar is seated on the extreme right. And you have Binod Bihari Mukherjee. If you were to look at from the left, there is a young boy, and there is a figure, a person in front, and one behind, and that is Binod Bihari Mukherjee. So this is the portrait of all those who were involved in a kind of a new revival of painting in Shanti Niketan. In the early years of uh, the 20th century, now Binod Bihari painted a number of paintings, I am showing you some. In this he is shown painting, that means he himself, is. it's a self-portrait. It's a portrait of himself sitting on the, some kind of a takhat or some kind of a place, uh, object. And then he has his table in front of me, him. And then he, there is a window or a door open and he has all his material. A very carefully, very detailed kind of a way of how an artist sits and paints his own or does his own work. He wandered around in his childhood to these ravines around Shantinikitan, the Birbhum area. And this reflected later in his work. As you can see that he made a painting called Khoai. Khoai would mean ravine or a kind of what in Gujarati we call Khai. So there was this large ravine with all the thorny bushes and trees. And this is a long scroll that he painted. And beyond that, he also at one stage when he was young decided to paint the ceiling of the boys' hostel. This is the little building of the boys' hostel in Shantiniketan. And on the ceiling, on the outer part of the building, he made this painting. It's about 8 feet wide and about 20 feet long. But he painted as though he was, how did he work? He perhaps sat on some stool or some big uh, scaffolding or something, but he sat down and he drew the, you know, the image of the, it's a Birbhum countryside, that area around Birbhum. So at a later stage, since this painting is in a very poor state of preservation, uh, we made some inquiries and found that somebody had taken a photograph in black and white, one of the students and who now is in the United States. And he was kind in Muthu Swami was his name, was able to give us the image. So we got the entire mural line. This is how the whole thing is. When it was painted and everything was clear and visible, you could see that Binod Bihari was painting it. It's like a map. So you turn on the left and you see the buildings which are coming towards you. You turn on the right and the trees coming towards you, you turn on the, on to, up and you see all the images towards you, you turn on. So you literally circulate to look at this painting and right in the middle there is a pond. In the pond are these animals bathing and then there are trees and animals and people etc. etc. I have a feeling that Satyajit Rai, who was a student of Binod Bihari Mukherjee, made a film called Pathir Panchali, his first film, where he portrays a small village in Bangor. Quite likely that he was influenced by a painting made by his teacher, Binod Bihari. And on him, he later on made a painting, uh, on him he also made a film. But this is another painting by Binod Bihari, in which he portrays a man who was an ordinary man, but he looked after all the trees in Shantiniketan. Shantiniketan is full of trees. And this man wandered around and literally knew each and every tree. So this man was the object of, you know, what you call attention for Vinod Bihari and Vinod Bihari when he's called tree lover. 
well, in the inner sense, he's, he has been venerated by uh, a small kind of a house which is being made in Santiniketan in his name. Binod Bihari on his own, despite his poor eyesight, in the 1930s, around 37 or so, traveled to Japan on his own, by boat. And he was able to make contacts with Japanese artists. He showed his work. So here he is one of the Japanese artists and showing his work there. But in 1956, when he came back from after he had retired from Shantiniketan, his wife Leela Mukherjee was also a painter. She was teaching in uh, Velam school in Dehradun. So he lived there, so they were near Shimla. And that is where I think an accident happened and he lost his second eye. He was completely, he was totally blind. But this kind of a blindness or whatever you call it, deprivation of sight, did not prevent him from doing something. So he began to draw. Even in his, while, you know, you know, on paper and he actually made a mural and here he is looking at something that he has made on the, uh, by touching the paper. But he made what he called, what we call paper cuts. He got this paper in different colors, you know, like what we call marble papers. And he would draw the image and somebody would cut it out for him. Then he would say, put it here, put it here, put it there. And that way, he himself, in his blindness, was making something which was almost as resilient and as, what you call, radiant, like the work of Matisse, who also made uh, paper cut. Well, he made very big paper cut. We know Bihari made paper cuts up to this size. Now, this is also a paper cut made by. So you have a full figure, two figures, three figures, in fact, and then you have the curtain. It's called Yatra or Jatra. Satyajit Rai, when he was making the film on Vinod Bihari, he's talking to him. And uh, that film is called The Inner Eye. And so in a way, what we are talking about right from the beginning is that that is the story of the eye. And you have this artist, you know, who had lost the eyesight. And despite the loss of the eyesight, he continued to work. Now, what I'm going to show you is something else. In 1947, at the cusp of independence, at the right, at the time when India was preparing for independence, Vinod Bihari undertook a project of making a mural, a mural about 77 feet long and about 8 foot high. Now here was a man who had only one eye and he wanted to do a mural of that size. There was no question of his making what we call facsimile, that means actual size drawing. He did not make. But he had little postcards on which he drew figures, like this. So he drew, and this is first part of the mural. This is the wall. One wall, I think it is the north wall, and then north or the south wall, yeah. Anyway, so what did he do? What did he paint? In some way there is a kind of a coming closer to Bishan Das, that he was also painting the saint, medieval saints of India. And he then made a kind of a long wall in which he painted. How did he paint? How did he, without making a drawing, putting it on the wall, Vinod Babu, in one of his articles, he was also a writer, so he wrote saying that, I learned from Indian art the idea of using my body, my body as a measure, my hand and my body. So, really measured the figure using his own body, his own hands or his own whatever, wherever his hand. Now, his eyesight was very poor, so he could not see beyond a certain few feet away. So, his vision was limited, but within that limited vision, he would devise figures, images, and he would move from figure to figure. And he chose the technique of bone fresco, which is an Italian technique in which you can 
only paint about one square foot a day because it is called wet wet fresco painting in which you use that plaster and paint or plaster you, you plaster the wall and then on which you apply colors the colors have to be applied before the plaster becomes dry so you have to finish that figure within that period of time before the plaster dries so every day literally you could do one foot so foot by foot from am uh, i or can i say hand by hand but using his own body he moved from left side painting the images you know that came to him within the span of suppose if i spread my hands this is the span of my vision and within that span every day he would divide these figures and he would go on painting again and again my teacher subramanian was his student and he also participated in the project and he also did some some part of painting that was also given to him now he told us that vinod babu had this idea that he will do it himself but his friend, his students were around now what do you see am i clear or shall i show you the detail i'll show you the detail if you begin from the left it almost looks as though it is the mountain scape where the sadhus are and there is some sadhu is facing us there is a sadhu who is going away at the bottom there is another sadhu there are a series of sadhu there is also a sadhu who has a nap then you see these sadhus moving down as though from the himalayas or from the mountains coming to the townships to the life of people and you see people there you know you have if you move on the right there is somebody seated under a what a kind of a bamboo canopy there is somebody a small figure there then there is another figure so the sadhus are moving and along with you you have to move so this painting and let me go back to velasquez when you see velasquez that painting you are still you are standing at one particular point from which you look at the whole world that the painter created in the case of bishandas it is in your hand the painting is as small as your own hands and you hold it in your hand and you enter through in the picture here there is a wall the size of about 77 feet in three different walls and it is about 8 foot high from the ground and there are 8 feet of that 77 feet are painted so you move from point to point so you it's a painting to be seen by walking painting to be seen by standing painting to be seen by holding in your hands and painting seen through walk from point to point and the painting suggests where to go and what to find so you see how this moves and it goes further right in the center of it and as it is contended both by subramanian and others that the tall figure which is almost what we call gothic figure is that of uh, ramanuj the great tamil saint and i would like to add here that it was ramanuj who brought all the sacred texts into local language instead of sanskrit he used tamil and he talked to people about bringing that sacred text into their own tongue he brought it so here he is surrounded by his disciples and one of the disciples on the right if you see one he has vague resemblance to ramakrishna paramahansa nothing particular vinod babu never made any reference to that but you can see that he is drawing imagery of different kinds from different sources so they are all gathered they are all surrounded by him and the tall figure rises almost like a large tree and you have the panorama of life opening around him and we see more forward we see that here is we come close to those uh, figure of ramanuja and uh, you can see that little woman and there are staircase over there 
next to Ramanuj comes the figure of Kabir. Vinod Babu had this question in his mind that if he wanted to paint Kabir, how would he paint Kabir? There are some odd pictures of Kabir in Mughal painting and all that, but he didn't want to use that. But he came to know and he knew that Kabir was a weaver. So he went to the colony, weaver's colony, where the weavers do their job. In the Kasam, whatever it is, the Shanti town. And he found his Kabir in an ordinary weaver. So this is the likeness of an ordinary weaver, which Kabir literally you know, represents in a kind of a physical form. There he is seated at the um, simple, ordinary, like all of us. You know, he is nothing very grand about it, nothing very glorious about it. But he is like the rest of the people. And what are the rest of the people? You have at the, behind him cotton carters. You have people who is wringing out clothes right on the top. You have somebody who is carrying water. Then you have people perhaps singing and listening to whatever. There is some kind of a Sangat taking place. But also you see that there is somebody who is taken in a palki above on the right. And you see that man. So there is a contrast there. That here is an ordinary figure of Kabir. And here is a kind of a figure who is being taken out in a palki by some mahant or a, a religious uh, uh, leader. So there is Kabir on the next in his uh, portrayal of the what you call medieval saints or saints of India or whatever you call it. That painting was not given an actual title. The title was given later, much later. That was partly because Vinod Babu was very close to a scholar called Hazari Prasad Dvivedi, who was teaching Hindi in Shanti Niketan at that point of time. And Hazari Prasad Ji was a great scholar and he had done a seminal book on Kabir. So it's quite likely that ideas came in that dialogue between Hazari Prasad and Vinod Bihari that he decided to make this painting. And as you can see at a later stage, that in the painting, the sakis are also uh, inscribed. What I was talking to you about, those the figures around the figure of Kabir, like you have the bishti, you have the cotton carders, you have man wringing out clothes, uh, uh, perhaps a rangarez, and here is the figure of Kabir. So what does he want to convey? In a strange sort of way, there is a, a kind of a figure of Sheikh Pool and figure of Kabir come close to. And there is no glory attached to it. It's an ordinary man. And here is this ordinary, but it is as though this figure is full of inner strength. Something which is not external, something which is not in the face or in the body, but the entire persona of the figure shows that he is one with the rest. So he is with people and people are like him. So in a sense you move forward to another wall. This is a slightly narrower wall. And there you have Tulsidas. On the right, if you see two figures standing, one on the right with a choti is Tulsidas, Goswami. And the figure in front of him we do not know who that is. It's quite likely that it is the figure of the Guru of Tulsidas, that is Narhariyanan. If it is Narhariyanan, why is he gesticulating in that manner? You can see that he is gesticulating with his hand like this, and then with another hand he is holding a serpentine staff. Perhaps there is an indication. I don't know whether you know the story, but there is a story of a saint who was actually some kind of whatever, ordinary man, but totally besotted to a courtesan. To such an extent that once when he could not be could not part with that lady, 
and she was living in a kind of a building which was two story high. He picked up a rope and climbed the, the balcony and there the Scottison came out and saw that what he considered was a rope was actually a snake. So he had actually picked up a snake and without realizing he was so besotted that he used a snake to climb up without ever realizing that snake could kill him any time. So the story goes that the courtesan told him, he said that look, you lost all your senses for me. You even braved the death. If you did this for your almighty, your God, what would happen? And they say that that came as a time of the turn. That man then finally turned to, you know, uh, you know, true life. So, if Narahariyanand is narrating the story of some saint, it's possible. I'm just guessing. But you have the city of Banaras opening up in front of you. You have the boat in which there are people you are rowing in. You have women who are bathing in the river. You have in the houses and shacks. There is also a, <coughs> a kind of a person, a barber there. And on the right, if you were to see, it is Manikarnika Ghat. And you have seen all the, what you call, domes, no? That is the word for them. No? These are the ones, you know, who help you, who facilitate you for burial or, or cremation of the dead bodies. So that is where comes uh, the next. And so here is the detail of the left. You see the city of Banaras, you see women, you have people in the house, people in the shops, what not. And then you have uh, Tulsidas and Naraharyanan, and you have people on the right and the domes, etc. Here is the figure two, two of them standing. I think this is most enigmatic figure of the Guru, you know, that Vinod Babu has portrayed there in his gesture and even in the look of him. And then it goes further. <coughs> there it moves forward, the third wall. And so now, somehow the Panara story continues. And again in the streets, you find this tall man, little further, if you see, come closer to it. Shall I show it to you? Here is the tall figure of Surdas. So here is the blind bard. Is there any connection with his poor eyesight? Is there a premonition of his losing the sight? The artist? Why did he choose Surdas? And he chose Surdas and he sees everything going around him. It's a little boy, a, a little boy, a sadhu boy, leading him. And there is a woman with a child just next to, just behind him. And you have the city around him. And as I was telling you on the right, at the top, there are the verses of the poets are inscribed there. And the last is Guru Govind Singh. It's quite interesting and also there is a question about it. Why did he choose a militant saint? But he did anyway. Now here is a militant saint who is on a horseback with a sword and with his soldiers and you, he is moving around. So what is most fascinating and enigmatic is in front of Govind Singh, right there in the middle, a man, a little, I think a poor man seated there. What does he convey by showing that? Is it that there was strife in his time that he was risen, he, he rose against that kind of a, whatever, uh, you know, terror or that was perpetrated by the rulers of the time and that he had to rise in a kind of a militant manner. <coughs> My little story about Subramanian is that Vinod Babu perhaps I think chose 
the head of the horse, perhaps from a Chinese jade. There is an image of a Chinese jade, of a turning head of a horse. It's quite likely because he had he had worked as a librarian in Shantiniketan. He knew all works of art from various periods of time. But also, I think the two horsemen, Parat, one of them is painted by Subramanya. Perhaps, I think, as far as Subramanya goes, he says that Pinal Babu asked me to do something. And I said, can I do this? And he did this. And Vinod Babu did not correct it. He thought that it was very close to his own way of working. And that is how Subramanian also got involved in the project. So here you have Guru Govind Singh and you have his retinue at the back. You have the two soldiers in front of him. You have the old poor beggar, literally beggar, sitting in front of him. And here is the end. So you have you enter literally a village. You had started with some kind of a township. Then you had come to Banaras, big town. And now you come to a village. Now what you see, if I have detail, I will show you that. Sadhus continue to move throughout the painting that they had started from the Himalayas. A mother and child also continues to move in different phases. Somebody is sitting and planting a sapling is over there. Somebody is pulling out a thorn from his foot is there. Somebody and Sadhu with a kartal is singing. And then you have somebody looking back and you have women watching all the soldiers coming in. But beyond that is the village. And in the village, as you can see, you move forward further. Right at the end, it is perhaps a little pukur or a little pond in which there are lotuses. But right at the end of the lotus, what you see is a little room, little house with a woman, a child. So here is as though a new birth is taking place. You had begun with the old sadhus from the Himalayas and you are ended with a kind of a new new life that has come into this great panoramic epic painting of Vinod Bihari Mukherjee. And I think in that Vinod Babu paid his homage, perhaps in some way, to the notion of independence of the country. The country had become independent and here was this, that if you were to go back to anything you have, these are the figures to lean upon with this. I and my thank you very much. Thank you.